I love this part of church. I do. I love music and I love worship. And then I had three little ones who don't know how to sit yet in worship. And I really love worship and I'm pretty selfish about it. And when they distract me, I get pretty tense. I give the death glare, I'm getting upset. And last week, they were just kind of distracting. Not only were they distracting, but these thoughts just kept flooding through. Things that I can't do anything about. Worry and stress just start overwhelming me. And I, and I was so frustrated because I was missing entering into my favorite part of the service. And so, um, so this is going on, and I'm getting frustrated, and I'm having all these conversations in my head. And then she started playing The More I Seek You. And something just flooded over me. And... Um, and I was just this peace, and I just was, ooh, I'm going to sit here for a while and just dwell in this moment. This is, this is a good moment. And uh, call it God, I believe it was. Call it a good analogy that popped in my mind, whatever. But um, I had this analogy pop in my head. But years and years ago, a lady came to church here, and she took my family to a, family, a really fancy restaurant. And I want to say the Elks Club. Did they used to do really fancy? There's a restaurant. For whatever reason, this was fancy, and I want to say it was there, but I don't know if it was. I was pretty little. And, um, you know, I was young, and I was still pretty sure that chicken nuggets were the only way to eat in life, and my palate was not very mature, and I didn't really care to try new things. And, and uh, But we went to this fancy dinner, and in between courses, they brought, out, uh, brought us out lemon sorbet to cleanse our palate. And I could have cared less about cleansing my palate. I was just pretty excited that they brought dessert in the middle of, su of supper. This was pretty cool, and I could get used to this. This is pretty awesome. But um, as she explained to us why we were eating the lemon sorbet, and okay, you're cleansing the palate. Okay, great. But as I was sitting there and this song was washing over me, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, this is like lemon sorbet. It's cleansing your palate. It's cleansing my palate of the frustrations I've had, the bitter taste I've had in my mouth from the week's events, um, my preconceived ideas of how my kids should be acting or how this should be going, my preconceived of ideas of who God is, um, my, my frustrations of is my theology right, is, is who God, who I think he is, and it was just cleansing. And it brought it down to such a simple place. The more I seek him, the more I find him. The more I find him, the more I love him. And it was just this neutral, nice place. You know, and when we are in those places, that is when we can hear the voice of God and when we can feel his presence and, and, and experience what he has for us. When we are keeping everything in chaos Keep shoving that stuff down and not really appreciating what we're consuming. We miss it sometimes. And so um, I hope that that paints a picture for you and where we're going today. But bottom line, that is what our goal is in this life, to seek him, to pursue him. And the promises that we've been given are that we will find him. And we will. And that not only when we find him, we won't be disappointed. Oftentimes we do feel disappointed, but you know what? We often have failed to see that we didn't really find him. We found an idea, a theory, a method, but we didn't find him in these moments. Um, so in worship, like I said, this is my favorite time. The music part of worship is my fav one of my favorite times. It's therapy for me. It is where God and I do a lot of our work. And I do it a lot in the week on my own. But there's something different about coming into a building and doing it with, as a community and as a group of people. And, there's, and, there, and so these thoughts that I had last week led me to start pursuing some of these things that I was thinking about. And I listened to a couple podcasts this week and read some things and listened to uh, a lot of stuff. But anyway, and if you ever want to know what it is, let me know and I'll tell you the links and stuff. But um, I know for some people, maybe it isn't as crucial to them. But for me, it's like a lifeline. If I miss a Sunday, I, there's something missing. And it's not because I'm religious and I think, oh, I missed a Sunday. That's not my point at all. It's, it's just something, it does something for me. 
And so I know some people have a different aspect of it. Some people think it's just tradition. Some people think it's entertainment. Some people think it's something to do while we write our checks. You know, whatever it is, um, we all can have these different preconceived ideas of what worship is. But today I want to share it from a scientific, scientific standpoint. Because once you know, if you are doing something and you don't know what the purpose is, you're missing out. If you are just walking through life, I mean, how many times do we do that? What is the purpose of this life? We're missing out. And so um, I want to share this with you. And if you want to know this, I shortened this down from what this guy was talking about. And if you want to know the full length, let me know afterwards. But this is what worship is. Worship, when it involves music and when it is attached to music, it is more neurologically potent. Your brain is a lot more active. It activates the left temporal lobe where language happens and the right, which is where all the creative artsy part is. Sometimes I'm not sure mine does work. But anyway, it activates, um, language happens in the artsy part. The corpus callosum, the center of the brain, is where the two lobes communicate, and it fires it up. One level of worship is connected neurologically with listening, but another level is connected to participating and creating. What happens in a room full of people singing praise music is that it is very participatory compared to other forms of musical performance. And, every, and this is even, like, if people go to a concert, their study has shown that this is... And everyone has some way in which they are affecting and contributing to the environment of the room that amplifies the cognitive effect on the brain. It increases the capacity to process language. It creates a more positive frame of mind, more self-esteem and self-worth, which may sound contrary to worshiping God, but it's in the science. But it starts to create these neurological patterns that are similar, similar in everyone's brains on brain scans. Isn't that kind of cool? As you start to contemplate, meditate, you are moving your focus from yourself onto others, onto your family, onto your community, onto your part of the world, onto the humanity, and on to God. And this is all amplified by coming together and doing it in a community setting and by music being involved. When you get everyone together and they experience something that leads them to more awareness of others and less focus on ourselves. So that's the purpose of worship. And it's a pretty good purpose in my opinion. Because I often come here heavy laden with my own stuff worried about my own stuff. And as we, as a group of people, come together and lift our voices, it is actually physically beneficial for us. How cool is that? And these studies are done that it's, it's this kind of setting. It's praise music. It's worship music. It's not going to a Coldplay concert, as great and fun as those are. It doesn't do the exact same thing that this does. Isn't that exciting? And so when we wake up in the morning and we decide, am I going to go or not go? Does it really all, and I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad, does it matter if I'm there for the music? You know what? For some of us, it really, really, really does. Because I don't know about you, but I've got a lot of negative patterns dug into my brain too. <laughs> so the more positive ones I can get in, man, how beneficial. But coming together, and I want to say that this is from... Um, a scientist who he even like uh, he has lost his faith and stuff but he said he used to be so cynical of a worship type setting and now he says I cannot be cynical of what it does and so what is the purpose of church what is the purpose of coming here maybe you say that's great but I'm I'm like Marty I'm still not ready to sing that's okay that's that's your choice but at least now you know what it does do for you and the importance of it and you cannot deny how amazing it is and how amazing God created our bodies and how amazing God has set up what we call church and what he desires for it to look like and church is not just this building man I've had some amazing church services with two people you can have an amazing church service it's, it's the community, it's the bonding, it's the fellowship. 
And it's what the Bible talks about, coming together and edifying one another and building one another up. Man, when Marty gets up there and he expresses feelings that I have, it brings me a level of, oh, so I'm not completely crazy. <laughs> okay, somebody else has gone through this too. And it builds me up. It edifies me and it lifts me up. So through the course of this week and things I've been studying and conversations that I've had with people and really asking, what is the purpose of this and are we doing it correctly and what is it supposed to look like? And, you know, I'm open to, to correction in all those areas, but my own personal conclusion has come to this. Yes, this is really important. Coming together is really important. Not only for our physical bodies, for our mental health, but for one another and what we offer one another. And you can say, well, that's really easy for you to say because this is technically your job. It is. This is what I've committed to from a young person. This is what I wanted to do. This is where I wanted to be involved. This is the body that I feel led to be uh, involved in. But I can honestly, honestly tell you after some searching that if I went anywhere else, if I moved anywhere else, if I, I was called anywhere else, I would be involved in a body because there's just something about it that brings me back to who God really is. We get caught up in the perfection of it all and the, and the entertainment of it all and what it should look like, and I'm constantly searching and asking how I can be more relevant to my Sela kids and how am I missing it, and please, God, show me what it is that you want me to do and what you want me to be, but I'm not stopping. I'm still seeking. And that is what we've been called to do on this, in this life. We have been called to seek him. That's what he's asked us. This life is a journey, and there's so much amazing, um, so many amazing adventures and so much to take in and the beauty of this world, and yet our biggest part is pursuing him and seeking him. And the more you seek him, I promise you, the more you're going to find him. The more you find him, I know you can't help but fall in love with him. The more you pursue him. Because he is a really big God. And he is a really amazing God. And there are no words in this earthly language to describe just how grand he is. But he reveals these to us in little times, like when we're singing Good, Good Father. He, he reveals these to us when we're watching our kids play at the park or when we're taking a, a walk through the hills. And he reveals himself to us in everyday ordinary moments where we get to capture just the glimpse of his, how grand he is. And it's enough to keep us pursuing more, or I hope it is for you. And it's never an area that we're going to come to and say, I have arrived. One of the things my uncle has talked to me about we, um, was one of the things he believed, and I hope he doesn't mind, but is that by the age of 30 that he'd have everything figured out. We've all had these like imaginary timelines in our life. By this point, we will have life figured out. By the time our kids are five, we should have parenting figured out. Not even close. Um, it, it, there is no arriving on this side of eternity. And I'm pretty sure on the other side, there's still a lot more learning. There is no, ah, oh, I've done it. I've achieved it. It's this endless journey. And that sounds exhausting. Or, as my perception has changed lately, it's thrilling. It's exciting. And the pressure has kind of come off that I've got a timeline to figure this out. But no, every day I'm going to see more of him. Every day I get to see another glimpse and another side, another gift that he has for me. But oftentimes, when we start pursuing this whole relationship with God, he, is, he becomes the best case scenario for us. Oh God, I've stumbled upon God. Oh, I've read some of his word. Yeah, this seems like the best case scenario. I think I'll go with this. Yes, this will be good. And God is going to be my shield, which he does. He promises he will be our shield. 
He does. He promises that absolutely. Okay, he's my shield. And now I'm secure because now I uh, something happens to me, I'm going to heaven. So I got that covered. That's pretty cool. Um, okay, um, yeah, I can just, he's going to keep me from bad things. He's going to prevent these things from happening because I because I say I love him and because I do go to church every Sunday. So this has got to be earning me some kind of points. And so, yep, this is the path I'm going to go. And yep, I'm a Christian and I believe in God. And yep, here I go. And then what happens one day? Something terrible happens. And my shield is broken. And I throw it away. And I stop pursuing. Or I don't throw it away. And I start saying things like, well, I must be a screw-up. I must have done something to tick God off. I must be evil. Or my favorite, it's God's will. He's, it's his will for me to go through this trial. It's, it's my, God's will for my parents to be sick and my daughter to be sick. Okay, so I'll just, I'll, st- I'll stay here. And we quit seeking. That song, he's calling us deeper. He is. Man, you've got a taste of who he is, and he's saying that's just a taste. Come deeper. I've got more for you. I have things that you can't imagine in this life. Glimpses of me that you didn't think were possible. Come deeper. My part is I must not stop pursuing. I must keep seeking and digging. And when I have those moments of revelation, may I hold on to them. May I let them encompass me and bring the comfort that they need. And may I go, okay, there's even more. That felt really good and that was really exciting. And there's even more that he has for me. But oftentimes, our perception of who God is will keep us from going any deeper. For me, um, I'm grateful for how I was brought up and the education I had. I have this personality, though. Uh, Jen and I talk about it. We think it's a middle child thing. We don't always love getting in trouble. It's not our favorite thing. And so oftentimes, for me personally, I made assumptions. If I said this or asked this or did this, that's going to get me in trouble. So I just won't. So there's a lot of times in my education and my upbringing that some uh, uh, a theory would be presented to me or something would come across in my education and I go, I don't know what that means. And I'm just going to turn off my brain. And I did over and over. I did not go to anyone. Why did I not go to anyone to say, this doesn't make sense to me? I would have been a far better student. But um, okay, that doesn't make sense to me. I'm shutting off the brain. I'll just go and cruise control. And oftentimes in our life, that's what we do when we hit troubled waters. We go on cruise control. And we just say, okay, well, God wants this for me. Oh, let's, let's go. I'll just ride it out. And I'm not saying that because you know more of God, evil things are going to stop happening. No, but, when you, man, when you're going through those evil things and you have God with you, there's nothing better. But oftentimes what we do is we limit ourselves and we say, I'm not smart enough to figure out the word of God. What if I get it wrong? What if I read the word of God and I interpret it wrong? Okay, some of the things that are being presented here at our church, I'm not understanding. And instead of maybe pursuing and going a little deeper, we go on cruise control. And we go, I don't don't know what that means. But I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to put it aside. I'm not going to question it. I don't want to question anyone. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to doubt anyone. I don't want to get in trouble. And we go in cruise control when God is so much bigger than that. And he's saying, no, come on. Get in there. Find out who I am. And you have a question, ask. If you're weak in an area, go research. Go search it out. Go find out. If you find an answer that you're not sure what it means, don't stop. Keep going. Don't go on cruise control. <clears throat> Richard Rohr says it this way. When we're looking for God, we often see what we are ready to see, expect to see, and even desire to see. So it is a change of perception that oftentimes needs to happen. Oftentimes, how many times have we heard it and we've seen it? Anybody can pick up this Bible and interpret it 
according to their agenda. We've seen it time and time again. So I try to explain to people, I love Jesus more than the next person. I mean, just as much as the next person. But when a pedophile comes and justifies his whole life because of the Bible, okay, they don't know who Jesus is. They haven't discovered who he really is. They've taken a piece of what has been written about him, and they've perverted it, and they've twisted it to fit their agenda. And so that is intimidating. For me, that has been, man, I do not want to misinterpret who God is. I need to have the right perspective of who God is. We talk about it here all the time from a heart level of who God is and how things have been distorted in our lives like that. So those are issues that we need to, to, to deal with. But can I just say you are able to interpret the word of God the way he'd want you to interpret it? And you're going to hit some roadblocks, and you're going to hit your head against a few walls going, I don't know, but you, you're you able to. The Holy Spirit is a wonderful gift, and he can, when you are open to allowing him to speak to you, he can reveal things to you in the way they were intended to be revealed to you, and the way they were written, the way God wanted them to be to you. You know, every time I get up here, I seriously, you can ask my husband every time, Every time I'm asked to get up here, I have to physically fight being nauseous the whole time. And I was actually telling my little boy today, I said, will you pray for mom? I got to preach today, and I just, I need some prayer. And he goes, are you telling me that you're an adult and you're still scared to get on stage? And I was like, yes, I am. Going to own that one. I am. And on, and I asked him to pray, and he was kind of looking at me like I was weird, and he walked away. And I was like, okay, whatever. And on the way here, spontaneously, he just goes, Jesus, I just ask that you help my mom. She's got to speak today on stage, and I just pray that she's not scared. Ah, cry in my eyes on the way here. <clears throat> but why? Because I do not claim that I have it all together. Man, a few weeks ago, I got up here and spoke something about, um, I don't even remember what it was, but it was something God was revealing in my life and 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 working with me in my own life, and I got up and shared it, and I got down, and the next day my dad came over, and I was bawling, and I said, I feel like a fraud. I feel like an absolute fraud. Because God's working with me on that, but I am not doing that in my life. I know that that's what he wants from me, and yet I have not let go of the control and the fear and all these things that so easily entangle us I feel like a fraud. So when I get up here, my my heart is that I don't offend anyone. And my heart is that I do encourage you and edify you and build you up. And my heart is that I lead you to a way to pursue him more on your own. And may I not be a stumbling block for you. But you know what? I don't have it all together. So I get real nervous coming up here. And you can ask my husband all day long. I will be self-analyzing myself and going, oh, I just want to hide for the rest of the day. But as my dear friend told me this week, as we were talking about a similar subject, is God not big enough? Is he not the restorer? Is he not the reconciler? Is he not big enough in my life and in your life to correct when things need to be corrected, to reveal when things need to be revealed? And yes, it's a process, and it doesn't always happen overnight. And some of these things that we get stumbled upon do create complete heartache. I do not take this lightly because I know people have used the pulpit and have hurt other people. I do not take it lightly. But is God not big enough for you, for you to go home? And like Marty said, I love it. That is the desire and the hope that when you go out this week, you ponder the things that God has spoken here today or, or, the, or the songs that were played that, that minister to your soul, your soul, that you go home and you don't go, that was a nice Sunday service, now let's all go eat and we'll go on on our week. May you go home and think about it and question it and doubt it and go research it for yourself and find out what he's saying to you. Is he not big enough? He's big enough. He's big enough in my life, and he's big enough in your life to do those things. So when we approach our time with him in meditation and in his, her, in his word, rather than approach it from an overwhelming feeling, as I have so many times, I'm not worthy, I'm not smart enough, I could miss it. 
How many times have I gone and I read the Bible and I gone, I don't know what you're saying there. And I don't want to get it wrong. But is he not big enough to bring correction when I need it corrected? And may we approach it like this. I'm seeking. And I will keep on seeking. And the more I seek him, the more I'm going to find him. And I know the more I find him, the more I'm going to love him. I'm letting God be big enough to correct me when I need corrected, to restore me when I need to be restored. I'm going to keep on seeking. In Luke 11, 9, it says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for you. I'm going to keep on knocking and he's going to keep on opening that door, inviting me to come dine with him and keep fellowship with him and have truth be revealed to me. Man, I love that song. Here's my heart. Speak truth. So what is, what is the purpose of music? What is the purpose of church? Oh, man, to come together and go, I don't got it all together. You may be farther along than me, but you don't probably have it all together. But we're going to lift up our voices, and together as a community, we are going to say we're seeking. We're pursuing We want more of him in our lives. We want to be more of him on this earth. He boils down to love. May I be love in this earth. May I be who he's asked me to be. May the lies that I've held on to so long, may I find the courage to finally let them go. And we do it as a body. And the Bible talks about how there's, we're one body, but there's so many different talents and gifts and, and, and people are prophets and preachers and teachers and all those things. And it's so true. You look, at any, you look at any organization and that's it. It's pieces of people that are doing their part in their gift. And when we come together, we're just, you go, I'm just sitting here just enjoying. But you're bringing a part. Your part affects the atmosphere in this room. The person to your left and to your right that you might have a little bit of an issue with, their part affects the atmosphere of this room. And when we can come and pursue it as, this is just another way, another tool to help me on my journey in seeking him, to go home and think about what Marty said. How, what a gift to have a community and a place where you can do that. So is there a purpose? I believe so. I believe there's a purpose to come together and encourage one another and tell each other don't quit. And I really encourage you that if you come to something that you just theologically can't pan out or, man, in your heart you can't figure out or whatever it is and you go, I'm struggling with this, I encourage you to not stop. Ask questions. Read things that you normally wouldn't read. Go back in the Word and read it again and again. And uh, Man, I can read one verse, and depending on the day, it can mean four different things to me. But I encourage you to not stop. I heard a man tell this story once. He was, um, he has an amazing story, but he was always involved in church, grew up in the church, and um, loved God, was really talented in ministry and stuff, but he began doubting and wondering. And um, like how I explained earlier, he said he, he didn't know what he believed about God anymore, and he didn't know what all it meant, and did he have it all right. And he felt like a fraud because he kept going to church. He honestly said everything in me was probably so in disagreement with what the church was doing. Why why do I keep going? But he said deep inside he knew that it served some purpose, so he did not quit, and he did not stop seeking. And it was a journey for him, and he went through a lot of hurt and a lot of pain. But you know what? He found God. Not the God of his childhood with rules and regulations and misconceived ideas and theologies that weren't accurate, but he found God. 
So I encourage you, when you're seeking, keep on seeking. My grandpa always says, keep on keeping on. Keep going. But you know what we do need to do? Is to give up the expectation that we have to know it all right now. That we have to have it right, right now. That I have to be good enough to seek and study and spend time. Nope. We just have to keep on seeking. We have to just keep on going. And I do believe that this thing that was set up thousands of years ago, the church, does serve a purpose for you. And it serves a purpose for the person on your left and on the right. And when you come and you just say, yeah, that was a bad week. Do you know what that does to someone sometimes? I'm not alone. I'm not alone. You can be in a room full of people and feel really, really lonely. But may we as a body rise up to encourage one another. Not hold back in fear or, man, I, I just, I have my, this little group and that's all I need. No, God, who are you asking me to love today? Who in here needs a word of encouragement? And as we do it, may we stand up with one voice and get some neurological patterns going in our brain that's physically beneficial for us. So don't stop seeking. There is a point. It is thrilling. You are able, and it is worth it completely. So will you just stand with me today? Jesus, I know there's so many of us in here that are at different points and perspectives in our lives and in our journeys seeking after you, Heavenly Father. But today my prayer is that each one of us goes home and we get a little further down in our journey, a little further down on the road, that we grab on to a truth and we meditate it, as Marty said, and ponder it, get it in our hearts, and start applying it to our lives and to our actions even if it's just one word. But may we have more and more and more of you, Heavenly Father. You are the one that satisfies that thirst in our souls. Not another human, not another item, not another pat on the back, but you are the one that quenches that thirst. And may we pursue more of you in our walk. Lord, I just pray an amazing week for these people, sweet, sweet moments of just hearing your voice in the quiet. In your name I pray, amen.